I've always had a soft spot for choice-based story-driven games. They offer a unique experience, focusing more on story and making difficult choices that can alter the course of the story. The problem is that this genre does not have a lot of great games. Sure, we've had some fantastic releases over the years, but most other games are either average or just flat out bad. And honestly, that is to be expected. Because choice-based games are very hard to balance. It's a very shallow genre overall, however, of all the choice-based games released over the years, there's still one game that I think stands head and shoulders above the rest. Not only do I think Until Dawn is the best choice-based game out there, I don't think it's particularly close. This game is absolutely fantastic, and it remains one of my favorite games of all time. Most of these games fall under two categories. Games where your choices don't matter, but the story is great, so it's forgivable. Or the games where your choices do matter, but the story is not good. Until Dawn is able to check both of those boxes. Not only do your choices actually matter, the story in this game is also great. Today, I'm going to do a deep dive into Until Dawn's story and some of its gameplay elements, and hopefully by the end, you'll understand why I think Until Dawn remains the undisputed best game in its genre. One of the most noteworthy things about this game is how it's able to blend so many different horror elements. If you are a fan of the horror genre, then this game is right up your alley because this game has almost all the horror tropes that you can think of. We have ghosts, we have psycho murderers, we have torture games, we have gore, and of course we have monsters. If you break out the horror bingo card for this game, I promise you'll have a line filled out before you reach the end of chapter 5. Point is, this game presents itself in a very cliche manner. Just look at the prologue of the game. Isolated cabin filled with a bunch of young adults and a mystery man wielding a machete outside. That's two classic horror tropes in the span of like 60 seconds. However, Until Dawn is one of those rare games where the cliches and tropes actually work because it helps set the tone for this game perfectly. The isolated cabin on top of a snowy mountain occupied by a bunch of college students is about as classic as you can get with a horror setting, and that's probably one of the best things about Until Dawn. Not only is it a great video game, it's the closest thing we have to a playable horror movie. In the first few hours of Until Dawn, you'll notice just how similar this game is to most modern day horror movies. Most of these characters come off as your typical horror characters, including the obvious final girl, the obvious bitch character, the goofy nerd, and the super hot girl. On the surface, Until Dawn seems to be very unoriginal with its ideas, but as the story unravels, you realize that the story in this game may not be as simple as it appears. As I mentioned earlier, I think the story in Until Dawn is one of the best parts about this game, so I'm going to do my best to break down the story and give my analysis as we go. So with that said, let's get started. The story starts off in the aforementioned cabin, and we're introduced to our ragtag group of friends. Among these characters are three siblings, Josh, Hannah, and Beth. After pulling a prank on Hannah, she runs off into the woods and Beth gives chase. After Beth finds Hannah, they're chased to the cliffside by an unknown threat, and both Hannah and Beth fall down the cliffside. Their bodies are never found, and they're both presumed dead. A year later, Josh invites everybody back to the cabin, and this is where we meet our cast of playable characters, which includes Sam, Mike, Chris, Ashley, Emily, Jessica, Matt, and Josh. If it wasn't obvious enough already, this game looks fantastic, and it still holds up nearly 10 years later. The lighting and facial animations are also amazing in this game. Walking through the snowy mountain over the dead of night is also a very nice contrast. Another thing that I love in this game are the fixed camera angles. It gives it a classic 90s horror vibe, and it also gives us some very good looking shots. This game does a really good job at presenting itself, and I don't think I can stress that enough. The whole gang eventually meets up at the cabin, and before they can even turn the fucking water on, most of the group decides to separate. Mike and Jessica are going to the guest cabin, Emily forgot her bag and she's going back into the woods with Matt, and after you turn the water on, Sam goes and takes a bath that's apparently three chapters long. I think this is a good time to talk about Until Dawn's gameplay. Considering the type of game that Until Dawn is, the gameplay is exactly what you expect, in that you walk around, you make choices, and you hit QTEs. That's pretty much it. This is, in fact, how most other choice-based games are. However, I do think Until Dawn is able to separate itself from the other games because of two things, the clues and the totem mechanic. Let's talk about the totems first. You guys remember the Gossip Stones from The Legend of Zelda? Well, Until Dawn has a mechanic that's kind of similar. While walking around in Until Dawn, you can find these totems which give premonitions of a possible future. These totems are categorized under Death, Danger, Guidance, Loss, and Fortune. These totems are incredibly helpful hints that are crucial if you want to keep everybody alive. I also just love the whole show-don't-tell type of approach. I will admit that some of these totems are either not helpful or just flat-out deceitful. Like this totem that told me to give Matt the flare gun, so I do it and then Matt immediately fires it, which could result in his death in the mines if you aren't careful. But, at the same time, these totems can be the difference between a character living and dying. I'm usually not the type of person who hunts for collectibles, but throughout Until Dawn, I was doing my best to find as many of these totems as I could. 
and it's not just the totems either. Clues can also be collected when playing through the game. These clues fall under three categories, 1952, the twins, and the mystery man. These clues can be anything, from simple posters to decapitated heads. I get that a lot of games have similar mechanics with the whole walking around to find evidence and or some kind of collectible item, but in Until Dawn, certain clues can have a direct impact on the story, which is incredibly rare in a game like this. The only other game I can think of is Detroit Become Human. I'll go into more detail on this point later, but for now I want to double back to the story. As you play through the early chapters of the game, jumping back and forth between characters, the player may start to notice something about the story. Nothing makes any fucking sense. Chris, Ashley, and Josh are dealing with ghost hauntings. Mike is chasing one of the mystery men towards the sanatorium after he presumably killed Jessica. Matt and Emily are being stalked by an unknown presence in the woods, and Sam is being chased by the same psycho who presumably killed Josh. You're bouncing back and forth between all these characters, and their respective plot lines are not consistent with each other at all. But I don't mean that in a bad way. In fact, I think this is the most compelling part about Until Dawn. The plot is so all over the place in the first half of the game, you just have to see it through just to see the explanation for it all. The game really tries to fuck with your expectations, and for the most part, I think it does a good job. As mentioned earlier, Mike and Jessica arrive at the guest cabin, but right before they get down to business, something grabs Jessica and rips her right through the door. Mike gives chase and eventually reaches a mineshaft where Jessica can be seen gravely injured on a fragile-looking elevator. Shortly after, the mine collapses and Jessica falls down the elevator shaft, and Mike presumes she's dead. Mike then chases down one of the mystery men towards the abandoned sanatorium. Meanwhile, back at the lodge, Chris, Josh, and Ashley decide to play with a Ouija board, and eventually they start talking to who they think is the spirit of Beth or Hannah. The Ouija board then spells out library, and then the planchette flies off the board. Josh is understandably overwhelmed by this and storms off, so Ashley and Chris decide to head for the library. In the library, they find a note threatening Josh's family, and shortly after that, both Ashley and Chris are attacked by a mystery man. It's important to note that this mystery man looks completely different than the one seen with Mike. After Chris wakes up, he walks to a shed and finds Josh and Ashley hooked up to a makeshift saw trap. I just want to take a second to point out that we just went from ghost hauntings to fucking saw traps, all in the span of like 10 minutes, but anyway. Regardless of what you choose, Josh will die and Ashley will live. Matt and Emily then find Chris and Ashley, who are understandably traumatized, and they all unanimously agree that they have to get off the mountain. Matt and Emily then head towards the cable car station. When they arrive, they find the place completely trashed and the cable car out of reach. Even if the cable car was within reach, they need a key, which they don't have. Emily then decides that a nearby fire tower would be their best option, considering that it may have a radio. When they arrive at the fire tower, they do in fact find a radio, and Emily is able to call for help. As they're calling for help, though, something cuts the tower's supports, and the tower ends up crashing into the mines. Matt is able to jump to safety, but Emily falls deeper into the mines and is presumed dead. Yeah, spoiler alert, she's not dead. We then bounce back to Chris and Ashley back at the lodge, and it turns out we're going right back into spooky paranormal shit. As Chris and Ashley are exploring the basement, they eventually find a dummy wearing Sam's clothing. The psycho then makes an appearance and incapacitates both Chris and Ashley. Chris then awakens strapped to a chair with Ashley sitting across from him and a loaded gun is placed on the table. Saw blades are seen roaring above their heads and the psycho then tells Chris he must make a decision to either shoot himself or shoot Ashley. Regardless of what the player chooses, the gun is revealed to be loaded with blanks. Sam and Mike walk into the room just in time to see the most unpredictable plot twist in history. Josh was the psycho the whole time. Alright, you want to know a criticism of Untold Dawn that I never really understood? I've seen more than one person bring up how insanely predictable this plot twist is, and yes, they are correct. This plot twist is super predictable. If you were hunting for clues like me, it starts to become glaringly obvious by the time you reach Chapter 5, but even without finding crucial pieces of evidence, the writing was on the wall from the start. The motive is obviously there, and he's the only character that's completely unplayable up to this point. Josh being the psycho was super predictable, but at the same time, I feel like it was intentional, because Josh is not the main antagonist in this game. Josh's very cruel prank was nothing but a smokescreen, hiding a much deadlier threat. Fucking Wendigos. This has got to be one of my favorite plot twists in any video game I have ever played. This game juggles so many different horror elements, and it keeps you guessing as to what's really going on here. One of the last things I anticipated, however, was the reveal that the mountain was occupied by Wendigos. Earlier, I criticized this game for not being original with most of its ideas. Well, having Wendigos as the main antagonist, I think, is a fantastic idea. Because as popular as a horror genre is, you don't see Wendigos a lot in modern media. I cannot stress enough how much I love this. Also, for those who don't know how the Wendigos ended up on this specific mountain, I'll explain it as fast as I can. In 1952, 30 men were working in the mines, but a cave-in resulted in them being stuck for weeks, 23 days to be exact. 
Of the 30 men who went into the mines, only 12 were rescued, and you can probably guess what happened to the other 18. Out of desperation for survival, the miners started eating each other, and as a result, released the spirit of the Wendigo. As the miners were being treated in the sanatorium, they experienced rapid and disturbing changes to their body, including the decay of skin, unnatural growth in the fingernails, and it was reported that one patient lifted over 700 pounds. As you can probably guess, the surviving miners turned into Wendigos and slaughtered everybody at the sanatorium. Now with that said, let's quickly double back to the story. After finding out that Josh is a psycho, Mike accuses him of killing Jessica, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we'll come back to this later. Chris and Mike decide that Josh is too dangerous to be left with the group and decide to lock him up in a nearby shed. This is where we learn that Josh is well off the deep end at this point. Just wiggle around. Gosh, dude! I leave me a little wiggle room, huh? We then switch over to Emily, who's still stuck in the mines. While exploring the mines, she encounters the same mystery man that was seen in the sanatorium and on the night of Hannah and Beth's disappearance. Emily tries running away, but it's revealed that this mystery man is not a threat. In fact, he's trying to help. He gives Emily a bag of flares and shoves her to safety. Emily is then chased by a Wendigo, but she's able to successfully escape back to the surface and hightails it towards the lodge. When we get back to the lodge, the group hears knocking at the door, and when they go to answer, they find the same mystery man who was just in the mines with Emily. The stranger explains the whole Wendigo situation, and after realizing that Josh isn't 100% responsible for all the horrible shit happening, Chris realizes that Josh is in danger and goes off to save him. The stranger and Chris then set off to save Josh, but when they arrive at the cabin, Josh is gone. Shortly after, a Wendigo kills the stranger, but thanks to some extremely convenient propane tanks, Chris is able to make it back to the lodge safely. The group then holds up in the basement, and Mike decides to go into the mines to find Josh, thinking he must have the key for the cable car. Mike then sets off by himself, leaving the rest of the group in the basement. While reading the flamethrower guy's notebook, Sam starts freaking out and says they have to get to Mike right now. Inside the sanatorium, Mike finds multiple Wendigos chained inside of cages. I don't have a definitive answer on this, however, I'm almost positive that this was the flamethrower guy, since he's the only person actively trying to contain the Wendigos. Mike eventually meets back up with Sam, and the two of them journey together into the mines while the rest of the group goes back to the lodge. Deep inside the mines, they eventually find Josh, and yeah, he's not having a good time. Mike snaps him out of it, and Josh eventually hands over the key for the cable car. For some reason, they decide to split up, and then Sam sets off by herself back towards the lodge. Alright, let's go, you fucked up son of a bitch. Josh and Mike start walking back, but Mike is seen being ambushed by something under the water. A few seconds later, a Wendigo pops up in front of Josh, and a familiar tattoo is seen on its shoulder. Yeah, it turns out that this Wendigo is Hannah. And if you've been collecting evidence throughout the game, then you can piece together what happened. A journal entry reveals that Beth was killed in the fall, and Hannah ended up surviving, suffering severe injuries including a broken leg. Hannah buried Beth and even made her a cross. Her gravesite can be found in Chapter 9, however the grave doesn't have a body. And a journal entry reveals that Hannah dug up the grave and ended up eating Beth's body out of desperation. And as the flamethrower guy explains, should any man or woman resort to cannibalism, and the spirit of the Wendigo shall be released. This goes back to the point I brought up earlier about evidence having a direct impact on the story. Certain clues and items can completely change the fate of certain characters. Take Hannah's journal as an example. If you find Hannah's journal, Sam and Mike are able to piece together that Hannah most likely turned into a Wendigo, and they end up relaying this information to Josh. Well, it turns out, if you didn't find this journal, it will result in Josh being killed on the spot by Hannah. Meanwhile, if Josh learns that his sister is one of the Wendigos, Josh will directly call her out by name, and Hannah ends up sparing Josh. Okay, sparing is perhaps the wrong word, but still. Another example is the flare gun in the fire tower. This could be completely missed for those who aren't observant and could result in Matt dying in the mines. This to me highlights one of the best parts about Until Dawn. As I said earlier, finding clues and collectibles that relate to the story is obviously nothing new in video games, but to have these collectible items being directly beneficial to your playthrough is something most other games in this genre don't do. Let's use a Telltale game as an example. When you're forced into these walking segments, you either solve a puzzle or go from point A to point B to keep the story rolling. Sure, you can sometimes talk to characters or interact with items, but it's nothing that's super consequential to the story. In Until Dawn, though, there's a lot more to these walking segments than just getting to your destination. Since, as mentioned earlier, these totems and certain pieces of evidence can be directly beneficial to your playthrough. Now with that on the table, let's quickly wrap up the story. Sam and Mike make it back to the lodge, and as they walk into the basement, they see the rest of the crew running away from Wendigos. Everybody makes it to the living room, but they're stopped in their tracks by Hannah. The Wendigos chasing the crew start fighting Hannah, and we end up getting a full-on Wendigo brawl. 
During the fight, a gas pipe is broken, and Mike and Sam quickly hatch a plan to break the light bulb and turn on the light switch, which would cause a massive explosion killing all the Wendigos inside. The plan works, and thanks to a little help from Hannah, Sam makes it to the door, flips the light switch, and sets the lodge ablaze, officially surviving until dawn. Now that wraps up Until Dawn's story, however there are a few more things I want to say before we end the video. Of all the things that this game does well, I personally think the best part is the fact that your choices actually matter. There are a few examples to bring up, but this one's probably my favorite. At the beginning of Chapter 4, when Jessica gets snatched by a Wendigo, you give Chase's mic, and as you're running, you encounter multiple forks in the road, and you have to choose between either going the long way or the short way. If you take the long way every single time, or fail enough QTEs, then Jessica will die during this segment. And for the record, this makes perfect sense. Your girlfriend is being grabbed and dragged through the forest by a monster. This is a very dire and urgent situation that requires you to be fast. Also, it's not just that segment either. Failing certain QTE segments can result in the permanent loss of a character. That's not even mentioning the butterfly effect system, which shows you exactly how your choices impacted certain characters. Also, I want to be clear on something. In a game like this, where making choices is the core gameplay, your choices having an impact on the story is one of those things that you have to get right. If I'm playing a choice-based game, and I'm not feeling the consequences of my choices, then that's how I get dragged out of your video game. However, a lot of these games balance it out by having a great story with interesting characters, The Walking Dead Season 1 being a prime example of this. But as I mentioned on the top of this video, Until Dawn checks both of those boxes. That to me is the real separator between Until Dawn and the rest of the choice-based video games. Not only do your choices actually matter in this game, but the story is also great. And you usually don't get both in games like this. Now with all that said, Until Dawn of course is not a perfect game, and as much as I love it, there are some glaring problems that should be addressed. First of all, Mike blaming Josh for Jessica's death is just flat out fucking stupid. Josh is about as average as you can get in terms of build. There's absolutely no fucking way any person would be physically capable of dragging Jessica through a door and dragging her hundreds of feet to a nearby mineshaft all in a matter of like two minutes. It looks like Mike's intelligence character trait was a bit misleading. Another problem with this game's story involves Josh's prank. Let's go back to the beginning of the game for a second. As the prank is going down, Josh and Chris can be seen passed out drunk on the counter downstairs. So can someone explain to me why a good chunk of Josh's prank is spent torturing the one guy that had nothing to do with his sister's disappearance? What makes this even worse is that the two people who hold the most responsibility, Mike and Jessica, Josh immediately sends them off to the guest cabin and leaves them alone for most of the night. It would make more sense to actually go after them, but instead Josh lays the fucking laser beam on Chris for reasons I don't understand. I get that part of it involves Chris not being a bitch and finally confessing his love for Ashley, but it's still incredibly confusing and it doesn't make a lot of sense. I also think this game stumbled a bit with its character playtime, especially in the second half of the game. Matt falls down a mineshaft in Chapter 6 and isn't seen again until Chapter 10. Jessica is even worse. She's presumed dead at the beginning of Chapter 4 and also isn't seen again until Chapter 10. I get that this game has a lot of characters to balance, but you can go 3 or 4 chapters without seeing certain characters, and it gets very jarring at certain points. Also, remember when I said failing QTEs can result in the permanent death of the character? Well, that is true, for everybody except Sam and Mike. For reasons unknown, Mike and Sam are completely unkillable until the final chapter of the game. It doesn't matter how many QTEs you fail or poor decisions you make. Honestly, this doesn't bother me as much as the other problems listed, but I still think it's worth bringing up. Now, I think that wraps up everything I have to say about this game. I've been playing choice-based games for quite some time now, and most of them are fine. They offer great interactive stories with interesting and likable characters, however the biggest problem with most of these games is that 99% of the time, these choices are completely hollow and inconsequential to the story. Telltale of course being the worst offender, and don't get it twisted, the Life is Strange games have the exact same problem. Until Dawn, on the other hand, offers everything those games have and more. You get memorable and likable characters, you get a fantastic horror setting, and you get a very scary antagonist. Also, and I don't think I can stress this enough, your choices actually matter, and I'm not just talking about simple dialogue changes. All of those reasons are why I think Until Dawn remains the best choice-based game of all time, and if I'm being honest, I think it's going to stay that way for a long time. I get that Supermassive hasn't had a great track record since Until Dawn's release, but I really do want these guys to succeed. I absolutely love the approach they take to their games, and while I don't think they can reach the heights of Until Dawn, I still think they're among the best in their field. We got Season 2 of The Dark Pictures coming soon, and hopefully this will get Supermassive back on track. And with that, I think I'm done. If you made it this far, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Also, please spare me with any comments relating to Heavy Rain. No, it's not a good video game.